What's up, y'all? My name is JR, and for those of you who don't already know, I'm a huge movie and TV nerd. If you're new here, I appreciate you taking the time to check out my channel. I hope you'll consider sticking around and joining the film community I'm trying to build here on YouTube. So in today's video, I'm going to be giving my recap, reaction, and review of the first episode of the Paramount Plus drama series, Landman. And just so you guys know, this video will contain spoilers, so if you haven't gotten around to watching this episode yet, and you don't want to know anything that happens in it, you might want to exit this video now. And with that being said, no more wasting time, let's get into it. Landman is an American drama television series created by Taylor Sheridan and Kristen Wallace based on the podcast Boomtown hosted by Wallace set within the world of oil rigs in West Texas where roughnecks and wildcat billionaires are fueling a boom so big it's reshaping our climate, our economy, and our geopolitics. Now the series stars Billy Bob Thornton, Allie Larder, Michelle Randolph, Jacob Laughlin, Kayla Wallace, James Jordan, Mark Colley, Paulina Chavez, Demi Moore, John Hamm, Mustafa Speaks, Andy Garcia, Michael Pena, Octavio Rodriguez, and J.R. Villarreal. And the series premiered on November 17th, 2024 on Paramount+. Plus. Now, at the time of the making this video, the series has a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes with a non-existent popcorn meter uh, because the series just premiered. The series has a meta score of 59 on Metacritic based on 11 critic reviews with a user score of 4.3 based on only four user ratings. And finally, the series does not yet have a rating on IMDb, which is interesting, uh, even though I know the show is just premiering. You know, but typically IMDb will have people who have seen it kind of before the premiere date. And so there's already a good amount of reviews on IMDb. But in this case, there aren't any as of yet. Now, you know, what made me interested in this show um, was the fact that it was being EP'd by none other than Taylor Sheridan, uh, who is quickly becoming my favorite modern TV producer. I also happen to think he's one of the best screenwriters in television. So, again, this is why, you know, when I heard that this show was coming out, even though I don't know a whole lot about, uh, you know, the Texas oil boom or anything of that nature, I thought I would give the show a chance. But once I saw that Billy Bob Thornton was starring, I was absolutely all in at that point. Now, episode one, entitled Landman, <laughs> starts with our main character, Tommy Norris, being held captive somewhere in Texas, um, by what I'm assuming are members of a Mexican drug cartel, claiming that they are the owners of the land that Tommy has been sent by an oil company called Mtex Oil to negotiate a service lease for. And after some back and forth, he, he convinces the leader of the group to sign a contract for said lease before they finally cut him loose and leave him all alone in the makeshift warehouse where they were holding him. Now, from there, we get a voiceover explaining both the relevancy of the oil and gas industry um, to all other industries and a brief explanation of what our main character, Tommy Norris, does for a living. You know, the company that employs him uh, before the opening credits roll. Now, from there, we skip ahead six months to see that the company has built roads on the land they lease from the cartel. And we see a plane land on said road as a white van races to meet it. We then see a semi truck barreling down said road, colliding with both the truck and the plane as men unload large quantities of drugs from the plane and put it in the van, um, killing everyone, including the truck driver. Now from there, we meet Cooper Norris, Tommy's son, as he washes up and gets ready for his first day on an MTEX drilling crew. He gets into a truck with Luis, Luis, excuse me, Armando and Elvio Medina as they leave the camp. Now, they stop by a bikini barista <laughs> to get coffee and the men make fun of Cooper for ordering a latte and holding up the line waiting behind them. Now, on the way to the patch, Luis explains why he shouldn't order lattes in their line of work before ultimately taking his cup and throwing it out the window. We then see Tommy in his bathroom injecting himself with testosterone, which I found interesting, as he prepares for work. 
Now, he walks into the kitchen and he talks to Dale, one of his roommates, about microwaving beans in the can. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, at that point, Nathan, a lawyer for the company, and Tommy's other roommate comes in and asks Dale when his hitch will be done. And he replies, today. Nathan then tells Tommy to be at the courthouse at 11 a.m. for a deposition. Now, at that moment, Tommy gets a call about the plane crash or truck crash, however you want to put it, and tells Nathan he has to push the deposition because he thinks he found their missing plane before pouring a cup of coffee uh, with no milk or sugar and leaving the house. Now, once he arrives at the site of the accident, he talks to a sheriff, Walt Joburg, and after finding out that their plane was their stolen plane was hauling drugs uh, that the truck who hit it didn't belong to them. Um, and that there are several dead from the accident. He negotiates with Sheriff Joe Berg to build a mile detour road so trucks can get around the incident site while um, Sheriff Joe Berg works to clean up the site. Now, as he's leaving the site, he gets a call from Angela, his ex-wife played by Allie Lauder, um, who, is going on about a vacation with someone named Victor and needs Tommy to take Ainsley, their 17 year old daughter while she's gone uh, because her new boyfriend is a high school football phenom and she doesn't want to leave them uh, alone in the house while she's gone. Now, Tommy, you know, reluctantly agrees and the pair flirt a bit and she asks about Cooper before Tommy tells her to tell Ainsley to go to the airport and fly to Odessa on the private plane with the company's engineers who are doing um, the same day today. Now, from there, we meet a man named Monty Miller, a Texas oil tycoon, having a business meeting before he has to step out and take a call from Tommy, who tells him about the wreck. Now, he tells Monty to call Clay Chandler, a lawyer out of Houston, to handle what is sure to be a string of lawsuits. Now, from there, we go out to a place called The Patch, uh, and we find Cooper climbing an oil rig, looking for something the other crew members are calling a Tucker valve supposedly located at the top of the rig. Now, once he gets to the top of the rig, they tell him that the valve is down at the bottom, which seems to frustrate him. But as he climbs down, he slips off the ladder and falls several feet, only stopping because he's hooked to a harness. Now, LVO then climbs up to him freehand and helps him back down to the ground, where he takes off his glove and notices that his hand has a deep gash in it, you know, from him grabbing at the ladder as he was falling. He then approaches the rest of the crew, and they all laugh at him. You know, first day jokes and pranks, <laughs> you know, now on a job that dangerous, I don't know why you would be acting like that, but OK. <laughs> now, next, we go to a place called the Pat's Cafe and we see Tommy come in for a meal. Now He's met by two other gentlemen who sit down at his table and one of them explains that they need to be compensated for a fire that burned up 8000 acres, costing them three hundred thousand dollars due to a faulty switch on one of the rigs. They go on to state that they will not let Tommy's company drill another well until their grievance is settled. Now, Tommy explains that he can get them their money in exchange for a solar lease, but that he was unwilling to um, pay them for damages because the company would have to admit fault. The men explain that their client d doesn't want solar panels on their ranch, but Tommy eventually gets them to agree to his terms and the men get up and leave. And I think that one of these men was the client and the other was the lawyer. Uh, in case that wasn't clear. Now, next, we see a private jet landing at the airport in Odessa, I'm assuming. And we finally meet Ainsley Norris, right? Tommy's rowdy 17 year old daughter, who it turns out brought her boyfriend, Dakota Loving, the football phenom, to Tommy's um, surprise. <laughs> now, on the way to the house, Tommy asked the kids what they would like to do for the night. Now, Ainsley asked if they can borrow a car. Tommy says no. But Dakota suggested they can go watch Permian Spring Game. I thought that was interesting. You know, Permian High School, you know, we've all heard of that. That's the Friday Night Lights school from the, from the Friday Night Lights movie that Billy Bob Thornton was also a star in. So I, I, I kind of like how that all came full circle. Anyway, Ainsley explains that Dakota is headed to Alabama and that she applies so that she can be there with him, but that the school is hard to get into. And so she's waiting to hear back. Now, Dakota tells her that he spoke to Nick Saban and explained how much he wanted her there. But Tommy kind of busts his bubble, explaining that Coach Saban retired. And that seems to make Ainsley suspicious, as well as Tommy, who agrees to take the kids to the game. Now, while they're at the game, Tommy watches as my man Dakota talks to all the girls. And I do mean all of them. Cheerleaders, sideline, female sideline reporters, everything. Right. He's the man. 
And as he stands there with his daughter and she tells him that if she doesn't get into Alabama, that she'll just die. (laughs) Tommy asks her if she and Dakota are having sex. And she was so honest with him that I have to admit it made me uncomfortable and it wasn't even my kid. Right. Um, She basically told her dad that they are indeed having sex. And when he asked if they were being careful, she told him that their rule was that Dakota could finish anywhere on her as long as he didn't finish anywhere in her. Boy, and I have to say, this was honestly one of the realest scenes I've seen in a TV show in quite some time. And as a screenwriter, I was absolutely positively blown away. And as a man watching a father have a sex conversation with his fairly attractive 17 year old daughter, I was absolutely mortified for him. (laughs) Now, next, we see Tommy at the concession stand buying a soda. He asked the girl behind the counter if they have bourbon. She says no, but she offers him um, a pot gummy at no charge instead. Now, he declines before getting a call from Luis informing him that Cooper survived his first day on the job. He explains that he doesn't say no when he tries, though it seems to be a waste of his college degree. Tommy tells Luis to just try and keep him out of trouble as he walks back out to the stands. Now, once he gets back out to the stands, he looks down onto the field and he sees my man Dakota feeling his daughter up in front of everyone. I'm talking about like palming her like it's a basketball. And (laughs) when he complains about it out loud, a young girl standing nearby thinks he's flirting with her. And she's like, you know, grossed out, right? Old man. And, And she's like high school age. But once she realizes that he's talking about his own daughter, she notices Dakota and she runs down to the field to try and talk to him. Um, so the writers are clearly trying to show you that, hey, Dakota's so much the man that everywhere he goes, there's just girls everywhere. Keep that in mind. Now, from there, Luis and crew drop Cooper off at his, you know, his pod at the camp. But when they realize he doesn't have any food on hand, uh, they take him to theirs. Now we see them cooking out and talking in Spanish as they, um, you know, as they grill out. And, you know, basically they tell Cooper, you're going to have to learn to speak Spanish because, you know, once we're off the clock, we're not going to be talking in English. So, you know, he said, you know, if you ask me, you know, anything I say in English, ask me how to say it in Spanish. And if you just keep doing that, you'll be bilingual in like a month. Now, um, so Armando receives a call from his daughter. Cooper then asks if his whole family works on the patch and he tells him that everybody's whole family works on the patch. He explains that especially if you're a felon and you want to make six figures, you work the patch. He goes on to explain to Cooper that LVO, his little brother, owns his own home and his wife doesn't work because he works the patch. He then tells Cooper that the meat's ready. So next we see them all gathered around a television inside eating. Cooper remarks that the food is good, but then he begins to cough, explaining that the food is also really hot as the guys all laugh at him. So he was just he was just the comic relief for the day. You know, I get it, though. Right. Now, back at Tommy's house, we see Dakota on the couch with Ainsley kissing and hugging and touching and rubbing and laughing. <laughs> Damn, boy, Tommy done had a long day. And Tommy finally announces that he's going to turn in before demanding that Ainsley join him in his bedroom, explaining that she can have the bed and he'll take the floor, the floor that's right in front of the door, <laughs> in an effort to keep Ainsley away from Dakota overnight, which I, I, I really can't blame him after the conversation they had at the football game. I mean, I, you have to do this if you're a father, right? You just have to. Um, he then tells Dakota, who asked where he's going to sleep, that he could sleep on the couch before reiterating that Ainsley needs to come with him. Now, inside the bedroom, Ainsley explains to her dad that he's not stopping anything by separating her from Dakota and that there's no telling what she'll let him do once he finally has her alone. Goodness gracious. Now, Tommy makes a comment about Ainsley acting like her mother and Ainsley asks him if he thinks she and Dakota will last. He tells her that he does not. He tells her that every relationship she ever has will be a failure except the last one. He then asks her if she thinks her relationship with Dakota is the last one. She explains that she wants it to be, that Dakota can have anyone he wants. Tommy explains that she can too. Ainsley explains that by her dad's logic, she should just break up with Dakota and spare herself the suffering. She then asks her dad if he thought his relationship with her mother would be the last one. He laughs and says no, but he tells her that as wrong as they were for each other, that he loved her, that he still does. Ainsley then tells her dad that she's never slept with Dakota, despite the numerous times they've had sex. And she asks her dad if she promises not to sleep with him, as in have sex with him, if she can go be with him on the couch. And her father reluctantly agrees to her terms. 
Now, she goes out to the couch and she nudges Dakota awake. And when he asks how she was able to come back out, she tells him that she promised her father that they wouldn't have sex and asks him if he can make the same promise that she did. Uh, he tells her that he'd rather not. She explains that he could just hold her. And apparently he declines. <laughs> and, and, and look, I will say this about Ainsley. The fact that, you know, because she spent a lot of the episode um, pretending like she didn't give a crap what her dad thought about, you know, her uh her situation with Dakota. So the fact that she promised her dad, she wouldn't sleep with him. And it appears that she was going to go through with that promise, uh, shows promise. Right. Uh, so next we see Ainsley knock on her father's bedroom door and she enters the room in tears, explaining that Dakota must not be the last one. Tommy makes room for Ainsley in the bed and he holds her as she cries before she asks, how come you're always right? And this is one of the best lines in the movie. And he replies, I mean, in, in the TV, in the episode. And he replies, because I spent my whole life being wrong. I felt that one, right? <laughs> he then says, fuck Alabama. And Ainsley repri- replies, yeah, fuck him. Now, from there, we see a truck traveling on a dirt road out to an isolated oil rig. And it turns out it's Luis, Armando, Elvio, and Cooper going out to work. As Luis begins to hammer away at a pipe attached to the well, they ask Cooper to run and fetch a 24-inch pipe wrench, which he struggles to find on the back of the truck. While he's searching, we can hear that the well is hissing, and we see it seems to be releasing gas. And just as Cooper finds a 24-inch pipe wrench, a spark ignites, and in what feels like a flash, the well erupts, and an explosion sends a giant flame shooting straight up knocking Cooper to the ground against the truck, blowing the windows out in the process and killing all three of the other men on his crew. Cut to black. So, you know, first off, I thought the opening image to the season and the series, um, you know, uh, was really, really good, both visually and from a narrative standpoint. I thought it started the story off letting the audience understand just how dangerous the oil industry could be especially if you worked on the ground and had to deal with, you know, all the people and competing interests. Right. And it shapes the way you watch the remainder of the episode all the way up until the end of the episode where all the looming danger and tension is paid off when Luis Armando and Elvio all die simply doing their jobs. Right. Um, Which I thought was ironic because during the episode, you're definitely made to think it's going to be Cooper that might end up getting himself killed at one at some point. Uh, let's knock on wood. I mean, he's a he's a he's clearly a main character and he'll be around for a while. But, you know, who knows at this point how long this show's going to be on the air. So, you know, I don't know. Right. Cooper could certainly catch an L before this all this whole thing is said and done. Right now. Um, I thought the macro writing for this episode was really good. Um, and the episode beats kind of kept the story moving forward in what I thought was a fairly fluid manner. Right. Uh, the episode went by fairly quickly. Like you, you, you get sometimes you'll get these hour long TV shows that are a struggle to get through. This was not that, even though, like I said, there wasn't a ton of action like this isn't like, you know, say like a mayor of Kingstown or even lioness that, you know, Taylor Sheridan has done this. This TV show felt more like Yellowstone to me, where it, it really is about the people. Right. Um, Now, the small writing was absolutely fantastic with extremely poignant dialogue throughout. Um, I was really, really impressed. Um, I especially like the conversations between Tommy and Ainsley, even though given the circumstances, what they talked about was absolutely terrifying. Right. Um, I thought the casting was really good. um, But Taylor Sheridan always does a good job with that. I thought the acting was great. And speaking of acting, Billy Bob Thornton was absolutely fantastic in this episode. Uh, I'm talking Emmy nomination. Good. I I can tell he's going to have a chance to win some stuff here with this TV show. Um, um, And he puts the series, at least to this point, on his back, in my opinion. I also thought there were compelling characters all around this episode, a lot of them in Tommy's own family. And I can tell that the story is going to focus on them moving forward, at least this season. Right. I think we're probably going to see Angela come to Odessa for a visit at some point during the season. And, and, and if she does, if I'm right about that, she and Tommy will probably do some hooking up at the very least. Um, just I know she's on vacation with some dude named Victor, but the way I see it, we don't even see his face in this episode, which leads me to think that he's a short term character, maybe just even a plot device, um, one that we may never actually see. I mean, you know, if you look on IMDb, Angela's last name is Norris, just like Tommy. So 
even though they're separated or whatever, she, she still has his last name. So how important could my man Victor be at this point, right? You know, he might be like a sugar daddy or a boy toy of some kind or whatever. But I absolutely think, especially, you know, with Ainsley asking, you know, him about her mom and if he thought they were going to last, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and he said no. And I also think that we could see them get back together. Right. Because, you know, in a lot of um, pilot episodes, you're kind of setting the pieces on the board to be moved around. Right. And you're kind of doing a lot of foreshadowing if people are paying close enough attention. So I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in this season, maybe, or at the very least, at some point in the story that Tommy um, reconciles with Angela and they decide to make a real go of it. You know what I mean? Um, Because, I mean, they were flirting pretty hard throughout the episode, you know, even though she comes across as a pain in the ass. Uh, a nice looking pain in the ass. Ali Larda still holds up pretty good after all these years, but the character, a pain in the ass nonetheless, right? <laughs> now, uh, overall, I'd give this episode an 80% or an 8.0 if you're thinking IMDb score. You know, after watching the first episode of this show, I found myself just as impressed and enthralled as I knew I would be with a Taylor Sheridan production, right? Um, I think Sheridan is extremely good at world building. And I thought he did an excellent job both explaining how the oil industry works um, and giving those of us who haven't got a clue the lay of the land, so to speak, even though I understand that a lot of the show's exposition was clearly opinion based. Um, but again, he does a really good job of explaining kind of what we should be paying attention to, um, kind of the the background information of the series. And I thought he did the same thing with Yellowstone. So that wasn't a surprise. That, that this was so well put together, but still, um, he, did, he did an absolutely fantastic job. But all that pales in comparison to the writing, in my opinion. And like I said, um, the, the macro writing here was good, but the small writing was great. And it's always been, in my mind, where Taylor Sheridan shines. You know, again, like I said, I can't say enough about the casting. I can't say enough about the acting. And, you know, look, Sheridan seems to be making his living with Paramount and and just about everything he's made there has turned to TV gold, if you ask me, right? And after just one episode, I have no doubt that Landman is just the next show in what's becoming a long line of shows that are going to further enhance the legacy of one Taylor Sheridan. But what do you guys think? Have you had a chance to watch the first episode of Landman yet? If you have, what did you think about it? Let me know in the comments. And for those of you that might be new to the channel, be sure to like and share this video. If you really like the content, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way you'll be notified whenever I drop a new video. You can also support the channel now by leaving a super thanks. If you should be so inclined, I'd greatly appreciate it. Also, be sure to go and check out themadscreenwriter.com for more television and film reviews and info on my upcoming film projects. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I got screenplays to write. And I'll catch you on the next video.